Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Environmental Coffee House. I am Sandy Shellis, and tonight, I'm so excited, actually. Drew Hempel, Void is Ying Yang, Void is Ying Yang, otherwise known as. Welcome. Everybody's probably pretty excited to see you. So, welcome. I got my uh, spirulina. Yeah. Let's algae. see. The, he's got the algae. 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 The show is the algae show. So, it looks like people are joining us. This is great, Drew. So, so Drew, tell us all about you. And when you're ready, I can pull things up. We've got an interactive show tonight, guys, but we're going to learn about Drew, who he is, and why he has the hat on. <laughs> he was going to tell us. And we're going to have fun because we all need a little fun since there's so much stress in this world. And, you know, being that my Tuesday night show is called Collapse, Last Week in Collapse, tonight we won't collapse too much. Right on. Okay, right. so, yeah, my, like, kind of Rastafarian hat. Um, it was actually, my dad got it from this concrete company and that he was working for, and he had a house party for them at our cabin. And I was supposed to play music for the party with my street flute friend, my street musician flute, flute, it, flute friend from New Bedford, Massachusetts. And he had like lead poison or something. He kept destroying flutes on me. And we didn't play the party at any rate. Uh, we used to play free jazz, and so my dad left this hat behind, and here you go. Now I'm sporting it. It's supposed to say, like, concrete, whatever the concrete company was. Whatever the <laughs> Which, concrete hey, company was. Oh, yeah. and con concrete was just on PBS News tonight. It's, like, the third largest. Um, concrete or this, hempcrete? Well, they're, they're talking about. They're trying to, you know, do the whole global warming thing for concrete because I said if you if you take out like China and the U.S., it would be like the third largest emitter of CO two in the world. The um, global, the the concrete, you know, yeah. global concrete emissions or the. Hello, New Bedford. Okay. Are you in New, Bed New Bedford? <laughs> is that is that your friend that you were talking? No, to? no, no, my friend. Yeah, I he moved back to New Bedford. He was living in. I'm from Minneapolis, so I I grew up playing music, and then I lived right across from a lake. So I was fishing all the time as a kid. I was kind of like a hermit, and I wanted to be a forest monk. By the time I was like 14 years old, that was my career path. I'm like, I want to be a forest monk. <laughs> okay, that's and, uh, I'm not a typical hmm. career to hear. <laughs> Well, I think it was like Forrester, Forrester at the time, but then I finished my master's degree yeah. at University, University of Minnesota doing, I was doing activism there, but then I finished it through the African studies department. And I did um, intensive meditation with this Chinese uh, Taoist monk. He's a yoga master. And so he meditated in a cave in full Lotus uh, for 28 days nonstop with no sleep. And then when he got out, he was in full Lotus meditation. And he, then he levitated up nine feet, which, of course, nobody can believe. But then he, he moved to Minnesota. He has a healing center there. He's been working with the Mayo Clinic, uh, Mayo Clinic doctors. Well, if you're so telling he, us, we believe it. <laughs> yeah, they did a study of him, and it was published in a peer-reviewed science journal on his external chi healing. And the, the lady, Dr. Ann Vincent, she said it was especially impressive results. They were healing chronic pain. And like people who had chronic pain that wasn't Heal treated me. by. <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah. He, the problem is now he's he's pretty expensive. Like to like I was lucky enough to get him when he was first starting out, you know, and that was like twenty five years ago. So wow. he could he could like see inside my body and long distance he would I could feel the center of my brain would be on fire like a laser, and to open up the third eye, and then I saw ghosts, and then um I could smell cancer. I fasted for a week on a half a glass of water. That's all I had. And I meditated the whole time, and then I could I could smell cancer like rotting flesh, and then um, I could see these ghosts, and it was really, really wild. And then, yeah, and this and I is had, all um, from the meditating. You weren't on ayahuasca or acid or mescaline I, or anything. I did I did test it out on I I did um, a really strong dose of um, uh, DMT based um, uh, plant plant root. It was uh, okay. Um, 
anyway, yeah, that was an intense experience, but um, not as strong as the just the meditation. And this guy, yeah, this so this guy he heals people all or stuff, but he's it's real expensive. And then because he just oh. has to meditate, he has to like maintain purity and meditate all the time, you know. So. Oh, well, you know, you do it. I mean, I watch you on your YouTube channel in the morning. You've been doing your, your, I'm not good at it, but you want to tell us a little bit about your um, Qigong? I got, yeah, so I basically, um, I saw this poster in 1995 of this lady, F.E.P. Chong, and she said she was going to do a Qigong demonstration. She was from San Francisco, and this is in St. Paul, and I didn't believe it, you know like a typical person, I'm like, well, this is interesting. And so I call up the number. I said, well, can we get half off? Because I was living with my girlfriend at the time. And, and so the, I could hear the lady in the background. She's like, yeah, so it was $10. And it was at St. Mary's University. And we're in the room. She's like, I'm going to fill the room with chi. And she had someone walk towards her like, can you feel the chi? She's like, yeah. And then um, and then she's like, I want you to put your palms together and make chi balls. And I felt this really strong magnetic force pushing my hands apart. I was only 24 years old at the time. And I was like a vegan. I was really healthy, you know, biking to work and all this. And um, mm. so I'm like, wow, this is really weird. I could feel this really strong magnetic force. And then and then she was just about done. And pretty much everybody was gone. All of a sudden, this security, this security guard lady walks in and says, I just want to know what's going on in here because the fuse got blown in the room behind you. Now it, you figure a fuse is at least like 15 amps, you know, yeah. for, so I'm just, I freaked out. Cause I'm like, okay, that's, that's too weird. And so then I went to San yeah, Francisco it, the next year. Yeah, so, I, weird. so that, and then I had this dream, I was keeping a journal at the time and I woke up at two 30 AM and I had this dream and it was more real. I wrote down in my journal right away. Like this dream is more real than being awake. And it was a dream of my earth first activist friends with native Americans. And they were standing on the roof of a house and they were holding a banner to protect a uh, sacred forest. Now that's a really specific dream, right? I wrote it down. Yes. And, th and then I said, I think this dream's going to come true because it was more real than being awake, you know? And I was some, you know, like I said, I was 24 years old. I forgot about it. And then I got into graduate school. I was, I was in graduate school. I was living at my friend's house. She was from Venezuela. Uh, she's an indigenous lady from Venezuela. And um, and all of a sudden, I, I had gotten involved. I was taking Winona LeDuc's environmental racism class at the University of Minnesota. And so I wrote this paper on, and it was on the cover of the Earth First Journal at the time. It was called the Minnehaha Free State. And I'm looking at this photo, and I got arrested at it as civil disobedience because I did a lot of civil disobedience, you know. And the photo was from a newspaper article, and it was a photo all of a sudden, I got this uncanny, you know, this uncanny sensation because I suddenly remembered my dream from three years ago because the photo was of my Earth First activist friends standing on the roof of a house Pretty with wild, Native American though. activists, and they were holding a banner to protect the. And so that was three years later, and I had totally very forgotten spiritual. about my dream. That very and so that, spiritual. And I never linked it back to the Qigong master because I'm like, why would I have this dream that come tr came true three years later? Now, it sound, most people would never believe in precognitive dreams, but Sir Roger Penrose, he has a Nobel Prize in, in physics, and he taught Stephen Hawking, you know. Mm -hmm. If you look up his latest stuff on YouTube, it's all about precogn precognition. Exactly. And he says, yeah, he says that's the foundation of, of um, what he calls proto-consciousness, which is like the foundation of reality. He says, like, if you do, like, extreme sports and go into the zone or if you're a musician and you're playing, you know, piano really fast, he says it's got to be precognitive from the future wow. you're getting information so if he said you know he says it's and then and then he has a whole you know there's i've so i've i've researched that a lot like i've been corresponding with I, after i got my master's degree i read one scholarly book a day for 10 years while i um dumpster dived i dumpster dived for food and i rode a old three-speed bicycle and i worked part-time at clean water action that was my life you're an you know, interesting and the, person <laughs> and i had all these psychic um healing experiences from the after my Qigong training where I'd sit in full lotus in public all the time. And then I'd have these like energy, basically you can experience reality like holographically. So like somebody else's emotions, you can experience them inside your body as like a frequency of, of light in your, in your body. And anyway, I had that, I wrote a book about it and I have all these books. Of course, nobody reads books. So it's, that's my way of like hiding. I still myself. read books. <laughs> Wait, I'm going to let me get your let me get your screen the screen share up and um let's so look, I, let's look at that's a couple my story. of your things. I know I like your story, but wait, we have more. 
because I can get the, I'm going to get the stuff up to show everybody. Well, some of the things yeah. you sent me and then right. why not? So let's hear. If you this click on the PDF link, you think, you know, the PDF, the PDF link, you got to go down to the PDF, like the red, that go see that PDF it's, or no, nothing wants to open. It's right here. Right this here. one, this one up here. I think it's the view video down file yeah, or the, I think that's yeah, that one. Yeah. Click on that. Yeah. But it's telling me. Oh, I have okay. to save it. Well, just tell us what this was, because it was from 1999. Well, I was okay. I was actually, I was actually, kind of, I was famous locally in the activist scene in the Twin Cities, and um, I was hired as an op-ed writer for the University of Minnesota newspaper. And so, the University of Minnesota is one of the largest campuses in the world. There's fifty thousand people. And it's a Big Ten University. And so what I did was I went to the, you'll, you'll relate to this because I went to the Technical Research Center and I got oh. all the contracts. I got all the research contracts for the university. And really? I discovered there was, th yeah, there was 350 different businesses that were getting, basically because of Reagan, you get 100% tax deduction when you, as a corporation, then you can control the research, you get free research lab, free researchers, Jeez. you know, you get access to the patent. So I, I exposed all this. I basically, there's a, um, there was a biology professor of the, the, the director, the chair of the biology department. Um, I ran into him at a used bookstore and then he was at a green party meeting. And I and I asked him a question. And he said, he goes, Drew, Drew Hempel. I thought there were six of you. And, so I was, <laughs> like, I was, and, and then he came up to me and yeah. he said, yeah, he said Cargill, Cargill and Monsanto took over the biology department, you know, at the university. And Lots I was, so I was, yeah. So I had all these op-eds. I was like, well, there's going to be a global water crisis in 25 years, which is where we're at right now. And I had an op-ed on that, you know, published. Yeah. In, you have your book, you have your, this here, the, uh, blog spot. Yeah. So this is one story I had where, um, I actually talked to Vice President Al Gore face to face for like a half an hour with I was with like a dozen of my activist friends and he had his Secret Service there. And then I was but I was the one who came up to him because he was walking out of the room and I said, what about the meeting you said you were going to have with us? And all the media were around me. So he had to comply to the you know, they had to s scan us, you know, make sure we didn't have any weapons or whatever. And then he wanted to shake all our hands and we're like, no, I shook his hand and, and but nobody else would shake his hand. And then. We just launched into him about why is your family business invading the Uwa indigenous people in the Ooh. Amazon rainforest in Colombia? And he's like, well, I'm vice president, so that's controlled by the corporate lawyer. You know, it's in a trust. And at first he said, well, my mom's sick and she needs the money. You know, and I'm like, well, you know, can't you just sell the shares? And he's like, no, it's controlled by the corporate lawyer. Well, I knew that was true because I had just read a book on the Rockefellers. And even if you're a Rockefeller, you have to sue your own family corporate <laughs> lawyer, you know, to try to change your investments. So, and my dad was a corporate lawyer. My dad was a corporate lawyer and he, he was a chief deputy officer of the Minnesota Attorney General Office. So I, I grew up um, in that environment where my, my parents were just like reading all the time. And my, my dad, you know, was real serious about like every word he said was he would take this super long time, you know, because he's. Yeah, but they weren't all... active as <laughs> you are. Um, no, they were they were like Nelson Rockefeller, um, you know, like. Ish. He believed. In, <laughs> yeah, he believed. He believed. He moved back to Minnesota. He was. He went to NYU for law, and then he got a CIA grant through the Ford Foundation. He didn't know it was CIA, but they. It turned out they screen all those international Ford Foundation grants through the Russia Institute at Columbia University, and he went over to Sweden to try to disprove socialism. You know, and this was in the. He did that for his. Wow, PhD. your father was like the antithesis of all of us. <laughs> yeah, and it, well, he was. Yeah, he was a corporate libertarian, you know, like the Heritage Foundation. Holy and the, shit. Amer and look yeah, at so you. Was great. Well, he would – see, that was great training for me because he would give me – he instead of – we, I would never have conversations with him. He would just say, here, here, read this book. And then I would write a critique of it. And so it was great training for me because then I would use that because I, I had to debate the whole university senate. You know, I had to debate the – I had to meet with the university general council nine times over a year. And it turned out he was in the same law firm that my dad had been in, wow. you know, so it was, so then, yeah, so I, I've, I helped, I found coalition, I founded coalitions and I, you know, started campaigns. We had, we got 1.5, 1.2 million dollars divested from Total Oil in Burma. I sent you that yes. article. There were, there was several articles. Is. You sent me a first, lot of stuff. 
This is yeah, not, that was, is this it? This is from this is for Alliant Tech. Alliant Tech was is one of the largest weapon manufacturers in the world, and they they manufacture landmines and depleted uranium. Dang. And we their headquarters were in Minnesota, and um, I got arrested there at least once, I think maybe twice. And then the judge, after I made the presentation to the judge, um, he left the room and he came back and he dropped all our charges. And then, and the guy who organized the protest, he came over to me. He says, "Like you should have been a lawyer, you know." And, and, <laughs> and basically, I, I just told him, "I said, you know, the charter, the charter of this corporation should be revoked by the attorney general." And and I said, "My dad was the chief deputy officer, you know, which because that's what um, my dad actually wrote the um, procedural manual that trained in all the lawyers for the attorney general's office." I just I went to the historical society just recently, and it was in the archives in their stack. And so I got a copy of that and it's all just technical legalese, you know, but yeah. they use that. They were using that for at least like seven years. They were using that to train all the lawyers. And so that was kind of Pretty fun. Wild. Cause wow. I'm like, well, if I can't even read this, it's so boring legalese. It's like, no wonder, <laughs> no wonder I couldn't, you know, my dad and I, we never really talked, you know, we would like, literally we just give each other books to read. And I told him, I, I read his books. I'm like, okay, now you read Noam Chomsky. He's like, why, I don't need, why should I read Noam Chomsky? I don't need to read Noam Chomsky, you know? Because it's like, that's the way power is, right? Like, if you're in power, you, why should you have to learn about stuff you don't want to learn about, you know? Damn. But well, you that's did a power... lot of studying, and I, and I'll, and you still do. <laughs> I mean, what what was this one? This was, you, you had a story okay. about... This is, yeah, this is where, basically, mm -hmm. I went to University of Wisconsin-Madison for my undergraduate. Right. And that's where I, I got initiated into activism there by this guy who was getting his PhD, and his parents were in Minnesota, and they, his, his mom runs a wildlife rehab center. And so he got, he finally got his PhD there in, in indigenous, indigenous farming from Zimbabwe. And so anyway, I moved back to Minneapolis and I'm like, I'm staying still in contact with all the Madison activists. In the meantime, he's like, well, we just did a FOIA request and the FBI had 900 pages on a couple dozen activists here. And you were one of them. Jeez. And my phone, I could Your hear that my phone. Yeah, it was tapped. Your father and, must have not been happy with that. Well, you know, like when Jesse Ventura got elected governor of Minnesota, he said he had, he he was called down to the basement of the state capitol, and he was surrounded by the CIA. They all they all interrogated him. They're like, okay, because he was an independent, and they're like, yeah. what are you going to do? Because they want to know. It's like, if you wild. look into electoral politics, like this, you know, like oh, like have. okay, like with nine eleven, this the flight the flight the the guys that flew the planes they were trained in a CIA drug smuggling airport in Florida. And there's a guy who he just died. The guy who wrote the books about that, Daniel Hopsicker. Yes. I, co yep. I corresponded with him for, for over email. So it's like if you really dig into this, like even Greg Palast, he I think he even He's talks got about a great how book. the um how the even the Democratic Party, you know, it's like yes. there's a lot of there's just a lot of CIA's drug smuggling. I just read um Douglas Valentine's book. Drug to, smuggling. Yeah, he went yeah. to into China. He went to Indochina and he personally interviewed CIA drug smugglers who are still living in Indochina. And why he are was, they smuggling drugs? Because if you want to fund secret wars and you don't want Jesus to have to depend Christ. on money for Congress, what better way to make money than smuggling yeah. drugs? Wasn't you know? that what the Iran Contra? There was yeah, a lot I, of yeah. The when Reagan there, have you seen have you seen the American there's a new doc on Netflix, American Conspiracy, Octopus no. Murders? No. I don't know if you ever watched Netflix. It's really like haven't. number three. Well, in the documentary, the guy, okay, they, they rely on this lady, Sherry Seymour, because she wrote the, like a book, she wrote a book on the talk. She did all the research on it, but the guy, the person who published her book, he was going to publish a book by me, the, the book like 12 years ago. Anyway, if you watch that documentary, they get into the holes, you know, Iran Contra drug smuggling stuff, but. Um, I remember it. And I used to get in these times magazine and they were. Yeah, in these times. Shit out of yeah, that's when I kind of woke up my first year in in college to to what was happening like that. Wow. Yeah, so I I was my basically my my graduate degree was basically activism and the president and the university even emailed me and he said, "Please do not go on unlimited hunger strike." And that's what I did to get this. You see this where this is the workers rights consortium this and yeah, you, this. and we the reason the president he emailed me and then he he got the he had the university join the workers rights consortium you know because they kept dragging their feet and so they met i had to meet with the lawyer nine times and i debated him directly nine times and it wasn't just him it was the whole pr department for the university 
And they were going, they were going through all sorts of shenanigans at the final, the very final meeting. He said, I hope the professors on this committee are tenured. Ooh. And so now I had a, I had an email activist list at the time and I directly quoted him and I sent that out to my whole activist list and went out, you know, to thousands of people in the twin cities. And the next day I went to check my university email account. I normally had 800 saved emails. They were, my whole email account was wiped out. That sucks. Holy. And shit. so I went, that's now, not good. We need you now, uh, Drew. We need you to teach civil disobedience now. We need a movement. That's why I'm, I'm list... interviewing Roger Hallam because. Okay. I... All right. Yeah. Well, basically, okay. This is okay. By 1996, I was working for Greenpeace full time in 1996. And just from all my activism experience and all my research, um, I, I, I remember the immediate moment when I realized we were doomed, like straight up doomed, like no turning back, full on doomed. And I was at my activist mentor's farmhouse. His parents, they live like, you know, they have like a stove that's wood heated and they have an outhouse and all that. And they okay. preserve. They got, yeah, they got an Audubon award. They got an Audubon award because his dad's a biology professor and they, and he teaches like, you know, he takes the kids, up, the students up to the wolves on, um, in the Lake Superior, you know, so they can study the wolves and, and they, they're preserving, they just donate all their land to create a new park and all this. So they, they stopped like a golf course, you know, they just save endangered species. They, so anyway, I, I was talking to his parents, they had gone to UC Berkeley in the sixties and they were part of the civil rights movement there, you know, so it's like, there's this direct lineage. And, and I, I just realized from all the activism I had been doing, because we were protesting nonstop. Um, I had been in the music department at, at Madison, University of Wisconsin, Madison, and the professor called me in, in my orchestration class and I had transposed a um, Schoenberg uh, piano sonata into a string quartet. And he says, I, you know, you got to come in for a meeting. And he sits me down and he says, this is communist. And, and I'm looking at him and I'm totally shocked, right? Because I'm like, it's a string quartet, you know, and... and, <laughs> and <laughs> Like, I didn't say anything, but then he's like, I want you to redo all your past assignments. Now, I had already gotten A's and B's on my past assignments, you know, so I knew this was obviously it was. But I had been protesting all the time, you know, in front of the like nearby the music school. And he would he he and the other professors in that department, they were all from Princeton and they were all bragging like, oh, we you'll get we'll get you into Princeton, you know, like to become a music, whatever, academic PhD and all that. And I'm just like, this is a joke. You know, I'm not going to I'm not going to. You know, I just dropped out of the music department because it's like, it's, so I went into international relations and I got environmental. There was a brand new degree in uh, sustainability where you're supposed to integrate biology, economics, and political science. So you take a third of your undergraduates in each of those three departments. So I was one of the first people to do that. I didn't know anybody else doing that. It was a brand new environmental option in international relations. What I discovered firsthand is each department lied about each other, you know, each dis discipline. So I'm sitting there writing papers and the, the professors are all, you know, they, I had one professor say, I wrote a paper promoting cooperatives in Mexico, the Ejidos, you know, the traditional cooperative farming in Mexico. And she, she gave me a, um, you know, a D and said it was intellectually dishonest. So I went up to her and what? I said, you know, oh, intellectually dishonest. Yeah. I said, I, re I put in all my references, you know, I, I, I cited my references and she's like, I think you're going to fail this class. Now the whole, the whole class was just promoting NAFTA. That was the whole class was just. Na how great NAFTA was. It was it's called Latin American International Relations. NAFTA, you know? yeah, sucked. <laughs> and this is yeah, this is right when NAFTA was coming out in 1992. Jesus we were Christ. protesting it all the all the time. So that was my typical. So you had a whole my, group. Yeah, we were part of the UW Greens. It yeah. was we got like the you know like the per the per groups that Ralph mm -hmm. Nader started the per. So we got we also got student fees. So I had I um we held a discussion on eco feminism yeah, that. Yeah, so we, but the 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 right the corporate right wingers they got rid of our, after I left, you know, I, they 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 defunded our group somehow. I don't know. That was after I was really? gone. Really? Because in New York, it's Nightburg. It was a big thing on our campus. No, I worked, but on oh the yeah, no, this wasn't. Kids... This was different. It was different than the Perks, but it was the same kind of structure. When it was we in got the nineties. I was working, but I was oh, working. Really? Cool. And the two thousands, yeah. yeah, they they were act, but it, but the kids were doing different things. The students, yeah, we. Yeah, I always worked. I always worked part-time jobs when I was in school. You know, I w worked part-time jobs, but I mainly, 
And then I did volunteer activism. And then I started getting paid for it. Well, I worked, my very first full-time job was at, for Citizens for a Better Environment right out of high school. And I did door-to-door -door canvassing. And I didn't, I just looked them up again and they won a Supreme Court case in That's the great. 80s. Yeah, because they were in some, they were in some hoity-toity community and the community was like, we don't allow people to go door to door. And so they took it all the way to the Supreme Court and they're like, no, that's against the First Amendment and the f whatever the blah, blah, blah amendments. <laughs> so to, so actually, you you know, you said you, you realized we were so screwed, but was yep. environmentally, what was the moment that you realized that? Because you were talking corporately or uh, academically that there's corruption. It's basically corruption. But yeah, when did yeah, you because, wake up? Because we're going to segue okay. soon, and because we all want to hear about the algae too. So excited. right, so I got I got a I got a YouTube comment reply from um, Guy McPherson recently, and he was confirming the E.O. Wilson book that he talks about because he said the very first instant instance of mentioning the mass extinction of species crisis was in 1992. So I read that book in 1992 because okay. I, I, I got a certificate in conservation biology at the School for Field Studies in Costa Rica. So I spent a semester there immersed in Costa Rica studying, you know, conservation okay. biology. So I'm just I'm just saying all my research, all my activism, it just it just culminated because I was studying, you know, U.S. imperialism and everything. And I was reading books after books. And I just, I could see like the science, the ecology, the damage, everything. And I just realized it suddenly hit me. There's no way, there's no political way. You know, there's no, um, just the other thing that I learned in 1996 is that I went to this, I went to protest the Democratic National Convention in Chicago. And there was a, an old cop came up to me, said, well, we're going to crack your skulls like we did in 68. And then I saw the formation of the cops and, you know, like an, a battalion and just saying they're not moving at all, just waiting to be called into action, you know. And um, there weren't many of us protesters. But anyway, like the cops, they raided our we had an anarchist convention that I attended and they raided it. I wasn't there at the time, but, you know, they were just harassing us. And then um, I, they had a talk on the uh, Richard Grossman. He was this lawyer. He gave a talk on programs, program of corporations, law and democracy. And he just talked about corporate personhood. And so in 1996, I already knew that, you know, the corporations are considered legal persons protected by the Bill of Rights. Yep. And so and so I, I was promoting that. Corporate person. When I, so I, when I went back to Minnesota, I was working at Clean Water Action. And um, and the, my office manager, one of my managers, I was doing data entry. So I helped get Keith Elson elected when he first ran for a uh, congressperson or whatever. I was doing all the data entry work. So I would type super fast at, at data entry, you know. And um, so my my office manager went to go work for Keith Elson. Well, I I had given my um, I gave him all the corporate personhood uh, research because I met up with this lawyer in who was working in the attorney general's office in Minnesota because mm -hmm. the attorney general has like a New York New York attorney general has revoked uh, corporate charters. So you might you might know about that. But the thing is is that um, you know Keith Elson he's doing a really good job of confronting corporate corruption. Good. Um, I don't know. I don't know if because my the guy I worked for went to go work for Keith Elson. He was his office manager, you know, when he was attorney general also. Mm -hmm. But so anyway, it's I've sort of just hung out, I've just kind of hung out in the like people. People were wondering because um, I was only working part time because I knew we were doomed. See, I was still doing activism, but it's like the reason you do activism because you have no choice. If you realize that Mother Nature's in control, you do activism because you're working for Mother Nature. You know, it's not like you know, you don't have a choice because Mother Nature's in control anyway. See what I mean? Like, instead of trying to save the planet, like, I had like, I had like two different people comment to me about this, you know, like, well, I said, I'm going to talk about this with Sandy, you know, because it's like, you know, it's like, well, like, we, you know, we need to save nature from humans, basically, like, now we're modern humans. I'm not saying we, humans have always been bad, but it's basically, since we developed agriculture around the world, essentially, um, and so, um, yeah, I knew we were doomed, but it, there was no point in telling anybody in 1996 because nobody would believe me, first of all. And if we were really doomed, well, what's the point anyway of telling them we're doomed? So I kept doing activism. But like when people would blame me for like trying to just get attention, you know, because like when I, I protested Monsanto all on my own, I went to the presidential state of the union talk at the university and I, I did this whole corporate um, research report of self-directed research exposing all the corporate control of research at the university. And 
and especially Monsanto with the genetic engineering, because the University of Minnesota, it's a big agriculture corporate. Yeah, sure. You know, they, so they were there. There was one. There was a dean, a dean bragging like, if "We will if you give us enough money, we'll give you soybeans the size of softballs." You know that kind of thing, because of genetic engineering. Wow. And so, I, and I was just this pointing out. Pretty what a hairy. Yeah. So I did yeah. that. I did that protest all on my own. I did. I passed out like two hundred report, and I did it to all the professors because they have to go and attend the State of the Union uh, presidential talk. You know, so I held a sign, and they did a little um, article in the university newspaper. But since I did it all on my own, because I couldn't, it's like, I can't take the time to try to convince people, you know, that was in like 1999. So that was before. And then, but then you started to have these huge global protests against Monsanto and the genetic oh, engineering. Yeah. But at the time, it's like people were saying to me, oh, I just, I just want to get attention to myself, you know, that kind of thing. So I didn't, I didn't really care because I'm like, I'm like, fine. Um, you know, Mother Nature's in control, and it's it's not like you can do activism, but the, like, like for example, I looked up my name. I looked up my name online one time, in like maybe like I don't know, 2006 or seven, and I discovered there was this report on the 12 top eco terrorists in the U.S., and I was one of them, and I was listed as a top eco terrorist. Why didn't you send me that link? <laughs> because they took it offline. It was for uh, really? some. It was for the National Fur Association. You know, one of those. Oh, I hate it. Yeah, business. I remember. Mm -hmm. National Fur Farm Association. And so anyway, um, and they have all these laws about agricultural eco terrorism. You know, like you can't go take photos of farms, you know, right. because then you're a terrorist. And so the the evidence against me was I was a quote habitual and quote multi sector activist. That's all they said. That's the only evidence they had against me. And because of that, I was one of the top 12 eco-terrorist uh, suspects. But what, but like I wrote an expose on Cargill and Cargill is the world's largest private corporation. Yes. They're, they're based in Minnesota and they're controlled by a family um, of billionaires. They have billionaires and they rely on like child slave labor in West Africa, you know, for, for cocoa, you know, that's one of their commodity crops is that they import all the cocoa. And, and so I wrote this big expose on Cargill. I had it published, you know, in the university newspaper. And then I go to this little underground communist uh, volunteer bookstore and nobody goes in there. It's like in a basement. There's like old, old vo volunteer, you, you know, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was like vets for peace. And I'm going in there and all of a sudden this, this student, this other nicely dressed student, he comes in right after me and it's just the two of us in there. Cause usually nobody's in there. And he's like, Oh, my aunt is the PR director for Cargill. He just, all of a sudden he just tells that to me, just like, you know, like out. it's a coincidence. And, 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 and so those, those are the kind of thing, like I had a professor email me saying, you will never be published in the Minnesota daily again. That's all this, e that was all this email said. And it, it's a professor, right? Like it's like a, like you're supposed to be for, you know, open research right. at a university, Sure. but he, so it was just a straight up. You were censorship. censored. You were censored uh, early. Well, that, yeah, that was yeah. my last. But see, the, the things, of, the things so. you were saying, though, Drew, really were correct. Yeah. So I had, okay, for example, I had a, I had one graduate class. It was like how to do graduate research, right? So we we're supposed to write a paper based on our research skills. So my paper was relying on Noam Chomsky and it was in 1999. And I wrote that the U.S. is going to invade Iraq again and that the sanctions are genocidal. And I and I cited I cited so Noam Chomsky good. why this is why this is going to happen mm -hmm. and then I and my the only comment on the paper from the instructor he had some PhD I don't know what but he's like the comment was quote too aggressive your paper is too aggressive and so then I made like hundreds of copies Scared of the paper <laughs> I suppose and I I stood on this little bridge with a banner it said stop U S genocide in Iraq and I got arrested a couple times you know doing. Sit-ins and our, our U.S. congressman, he changed his views. You know, he came out against the sanctions on Iraq, you know. So this was 1998, right? So sure enough, the, the U.S. invades Iraq, you know, 20, 2003. And at the time, people people kind of ignored my research because they couldn't, you know, like the whole point is to stay ahead of the game. You know what I mean? And at that time yeah. in 1998. So I'm like, if we had protested in 1998, and I didn't even know that the Project for New American Century had come out at the same year saying, you know, we need to have another uh, Pearl Harbor in order to invade Iraq and take back their oil, you know. Jesus Christ. I, I, you're not wrong. I mean, I know. I went to things I was involved, <laughs> not at the depth that you are, obviously. 
But, you know, we segue a little bit. So what happened? You, you, did you give up? Did you just decide, well, because I don't, I still think activism and, and civil disobedience okay. for things is, is worthwhile. Mm -hmm. No, like I said, I, I, I totally support activism, but, um, like, as, you know, people do not have a choice to do activism. I mean, like environmental protesters in other countries are murdered, you know? And, and so it's like, obviously, um, I mean, but on the other hand, I can relate to, um, DiCaprio, you know, DiCaprio not getting arrested. Like he's never done civil disobedience. He makes these documentaries from his private jet because if you get arrested from now, they, private jet. <laughs> yeah, because, well, no, no, I guess he doesn't, he no longer has a private jet. He has just his private yacht, you know, and he takes a helicopter on it, you know, into, from his private yacht to okay. yacht. But anyway, um, I've been corrected about that. So, but okay. Um, but the point is, is like, if you get arrested now, they automatically strip search you, you know, they cavity search you for drugs or whatever. And so they didn't do that. I got arrested eight times and I, I never had to go through that. So, because I consider that that would be, I mean, I don't even like going through the airport scanners where you got these perv, uh, I know. whatever guys like, you know, whatever. So the thing is, is that, okay, my, my very last column, my op-ed paid op-ed staff column for that was called truth repressed by psychic vampires. Now, now consider our situation. Now we have, you know, um, the business in, insider had a, a journalist graduate of Columbia University. They're one of the top journalist schools in the country, right? Yeah. And she published she published that Donald Donald Trump has fourteen phone contacts in Jeffrey Epstein's black book. Now you now you think that would make him a credibly alleged child rapist, you know? Because the other because like Netflix the the documentary on on Max Maxine. Uh, Giswell oh. or whatever her name is. Jizz. Yeah, she Giswell. Gisline. Right. Yeah. Gisline. And so she they they that documentary, it's pointed out that Mar a Lago was the number one source, like the main source for victims really? of Epstein in, in Florida. Because they get the masseuses, the young masseuses, and they're like, Oh, come on, you can go do masseuses. You know, so so basically this whole psychic what I learned from my um basically I took this class on race, class, and gender. And the then the chair of the African Studies Department, she taught the class, and I, and then we there was a book called The Racial Contract, and basically it argued ever since Plato that the idea of natural law has been based on eugenics and racism, and so I was arguing that well you so have to humans go to have sucked forever. Well, no, 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 no. Ever I since know. no, well, yeah, since Plato, not the forever. That's not <laughs> okay, that one. Not, not the forever. <laughs> So I was, I basically yeah. said, we need to practice non-Western, non-Western philosophy in order to break through this, this, basically this mind control from Platonic philosophy. Like if, if you go to that show, um, Planet Critical, she just had on, um, this guy, he got like the Guggenheim fellowship and he, he was going off against Plato. And I actually emailed him about it. Cause there's, you know, there's, when you get into Plato, you get into science, even Western science, it's all based on Platonic philosophy. And so, so that's how I finished my graduate degree. I trained in non-Western philosophy. And then I discovered that basically we're all brainwashed, like literally like left brain dominance with are dependent on writing and all that. Like it's, it's a form of, of mind control itself. And so, so we get these psychic vampires that take over that are relying on, um, you know, uh, child abuse and they're sucking off the energy of, of they're like, just like poltergeists would do, like a poltergeist would suck off a ch child's energy, you know, to, yeah. to cause tele well, telekinesis. <laughs> that's what they're doing. Right. They're, you know. well, and that's the big advertising is <laughs> one of the biggest of, you know, using of yeah, yeah. techniques, brainwashing yeah. techniques. Wow. Yeah. So, so it's, I just took it to a deeper level, you know, and yeah. then. And then, so then I, I put out this pamphlet called Etherealized Pranarchy, and it was kind of a joke, right? But my idea was like, well, if you can, you can use direct energy itself as my goal was to create a global revolution out of Minneapolis. And so I sat in full Lotus all the time in public and I'd read one scholarly book a day. Like, for example, like check out this book, right? Like yep. this book, this book, the scientists foundation for climate change forecasts. No, it documents in here that um, Joseph Fourier had the first um, paper on um, global warming in um, 1824. So he understood. Right okay. He understood so that. That's, uh, that's 200 burning. years ago. 200 wow. years ago. 
And so the guy, who, the guy who edited this book, he was he's a physics professor at um, David Archer. Well, no, the second guy, Archer. um, Raymond Pierre. Raymond oh, oh, Pierre. that one, the one you were talking about before, Raymond Pierre. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he was. I've corresponded with him several times because you know he was at University of Chicago and now he's at Oxford, and so he's like the world's expert on the quantum physics origin of global warming, and so. It's, it goes back 200 years. So like we've known the science of global warming for 200 years. 200 you know? years. And, and we and went so full we, steam ahead. Right. Yeah. We, and yeah, Joseph Fourier in that article, he literally says that the quote, the effects of human industry, unquote, are heating up the planet. So he knew 200 so years ago, the, the effects of human industry are going to heat up the planet. That's and, insane. Um, yeah, and so um, they probably thought it was crazy. Yeah, because okay, like if, like if you look at, um, like if you look at the internet now, like people, most people they have a smartphone, right? But I, I call them dumb phones because first, first of all, if you don't understand quantum physics, you don't like the the engineers they're relying on thermal uh, heat, and they say, well, the the phones they that there's not enough heat to cook your brains, but it's actually quantum physics. It's a quantum resonance, you know, with the water in your brain. And they've proven this, but of course the, so you have everybody using their smartphones, it's really dumbing them down. And then they have to type with one finger, you know? And so it's like, this is supposed to be the information superhighway, right? Like, <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Uh, it's, Here it is. Yeah, the information right. so, stupid high, super highway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so then you have all the algorithms. And so basically like there was a, there was a book just published on um, by one of the, you know, I, I watch uh, MSNBC. I watch the corporate news too. You know, I don't. I'm not like well totally if cut you're off from well rounded. That way, you understand how full of mm -hmm. shit some people are and how full of shit some people aren't. You know. Yeah. So, so there's a brand new book about how you know all the disinformation on the internet. So they want to try to have you know, regulations about. Oh. And then people freak out. They say, "Well, that's against free speech." But the thing is, is like. What basically you have all these, these algorithms are based, are there are based on emotional energy, right? Like, what what gets what you know like like if you have twerking, twerking's going to get the most clicks on the internet, right? Because right. it's like because it's that's like we're primates, and so you see somebody's you see you know somebody's backside, you know, on display. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like the internet's turned it is turned into this like like dopamine hit click yeah it is or, but they and, knew that the, the the designers knew that because they worked with psychologists and they right, knew yeah. that this is because they wanted to sell i mean so it's all mm -hmm. psychological uh pr principles behind it also yeah so the person who's on the tv on television and the mm -hmm. internet the most is also a credibly alleged child rapist and nobody can say that they won't like if you have yeah, basic morals if you have basic moral standards, like even if you go into prison, the lowest scum in prison is the child rapist, right? And they hate but, them, yeah. But but we but in in the real world, out out of prison, we have the most the person you know he likes bad news as much as good news, right? Because he just feeds off it because he's a psychic vampire, you know. So it's like you have the lowest scum in prison, and they're saying, oh, you know, we want to buy his Bible, you know, he's going to save us. And like, you have all these with these women fawning over a credibly alleged child rapist. And they think it's the greatest thing. It's sick. <laughs> Which child rapist did you mean? Chaz wants to say, oh, Jesus, <laughs> we know the, the one, the one the, that is always on the news that rhymes the, with dump. <laughs> yeah, his, his grandfather's name was Drumpf. And yeah, so it's Drumpf. like, if you call him, if you call him by his grandfather's name, like if every building had Trump on it, like would he, like would people release, you know, because that's all he has is his, his, even his name is fake. You I know thought I mean? like, the name was ugly. But anyway, you know what? I do not want to get into that. I know. I don't. I know. What I want to do is really move to where um, you flowed through. You, 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 yeah. The algae. We're, yeah. Because <laughs> here we are, and you understand through your intellectual endeavors uh, uh that the planet is in big trouble and that we are continuing to assault mother earth it's not stop right. yeah yeah so you discover the voices that are talking about these things and 
unfortunately, they are on the information stupid highway. Here we are. I mean, you've been following all of us in the doomosphere, you know. So take mm-hmm. us, let's fast forward so we so we can understand how did you get to where you are discovering the properties of algae and thinking that's like almost like the last ditch effort when you know that we're in trouble. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, okay. Yeah. Basically I was posting on gorilla news network back in the like 2004 to 2006. And you know, you realize that oil is from algae and it's like, okay, if oil is from algae, then it kind of makes sense that algae could reverse the damage of oil. You know what I mean? Like that's just sort of basic logic. So, okay. but then, and so then you find out that Exxon just pulled all their funding for algae. Like Exxon used to have all these slick ads on TV about uh, how great algae was as a biofuel. And they were trying to do genetic engineering of algae to try to make it um, competitive. You know, they wanted to have a competing barrel price with oil, you know, to have algae and they couldn't really? quite do it. So, yeah. So they pulled all the funding. But the thing is, is like, that's not the point because all the, you know, the economy is from ecology. Like, you know, like last summer, Iowa was one rainfall away from total crop failure. So this summer we could, we could completely have a total, we, we could have, you well, know, massive famine. A lot of people are saying it. I don't know if you're on um, Twitter or X, whatever, where there's, a, uh, there's a small group of people that continually discuss things like this and mm-hmm. you're, you're you're right on you're spot on it's scary it could be a very difficult awful season for farmers so what so basically as i researched this algae issue i found a quote that you 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 get you posted it as the title of my talk tonight yeah and it was it was published in the top science journal nature it was in 2008 and in that year the un passed a law a um against any kind of uh, fertilization of the ocean. And, but the end of that article, it's the senior scientist at the Monterey Research Institute. And he's saying that if the climate gets out of control, only algae can save us. Now, I thought that was a perfect quote because the thing is, is that, um, you know, that's not in the news. Like nobody, like even in the Doomer scene, like, okay, the, the guy just have a think. He did a video did. on algae. And, Two of them. And then, and Paul, Paul Beckwith, Beckwith, like I, I love to make fun of Paul because I think you know he's a great guy, and I, I so I like to make fun of we him. We all love Paul, yeah. <laughs> but he, but you know, he was he was promoting algae too. Like early on, he was promoting algae, and so okay, the thing is, is that um, the okay, now maybe we should let's play that video. That I'm the first going video. to. I was just thinking right. that. Okay. Let's change this up, and we have a video for you guys. Um, make sure it's correct here because i all right this one all right yeah. I'm full pretty, screen it full screen it full screen it yeah see it's it's i screwed up because i can't download i couldn't rip it all right here you we go possible marty is a competition do- with his plan to harness the engineering genius it's going to be a little low can you, can you, you click it can you click it forward a little bit but in case you want to check yeah. the math Sir David there King we went from there teaching we chemistry at Cambridge to a post as the UK's top science advisor and later the country's lead climate negotiator. But after a decade, he realized that geopolitics and oil lobbyists were eating up too much precious time. My own solution is 197 nations will never get agreement on how we have an orderly transition. So he went back to Cambridge form the Center for Climate Repair and now hopes to enlist some very big and powerful partners. And it's all based on a recent understanding of the function of whales in the ocean. The plan is called Marine Biomass Regeneration and it starts by spraying the deep oceans with gigatons of artificial whale poop. Now, the question is, where does the feces, the artificial feces, come from? Right. I have, that's one of many questions I have, but let's start with that one. He explains that when people drove baleen whales to near extinction, we lost the ocean's biggest fertilizer pumps. And as I learned for an upcoming episode of The Whole Story, one pot can gobble up nutrients from the deep and poop them across hundreds of square miles of ocean surface. Oh, we got poo? Look at that. 
<laughs> That's the goal. Supercharging the bottom of the food chain. Within three to four days in that area, you might have the whole area covered with phytoplankton. And then within five days of that, that whole area becomes full of fish. And since the biggest can weigh 28 tons, when they die, they take massive amounts of carbon Godzilla to the ocean depths and could be doing millions of dollars worth of carbon removal for free. We would say whaling has to stop completely, but you can catch as much fish as you like because we're going to return the oceans to billions of fish in this process. This idea has been tried before, spraying iron filings, I guess, on oceans. It's been rejected by governments uh, over time. What's new now that gives you confidence that people will accept this? So I believe that the idea of only using iron was uh, wrong. Volcanic ash contains all the nutrients that, that we need. It contains nitrates, phosphates, silicates, and iron. And so we plan to literally use volcanic dust as our artificial whale poo. But to recover in sufficient numbers, whales will need time. And we are out of time. But Sir David thinks we could buy precious years needed for ocean recovery by making clouds. Big, puffy white ones to reflect maximum sunlight away from the top of the world. So his team is designing hydrofoil. All right, we're done. All right. Okay. We're back on okay. to together. Where All are right, we? Does, how, how's the chat doing? Because normally I'm trolling the chat. And... They seem to be doing pretty good. How you guys doing? <laughs> All right, so let's talk about that because on your video, when you did your video yesterday, you were talking about the well, the deaths that you know were really, we really said goodbye, you know, to a lot of whales. Yeah, um, it's okay. Do you want to put my paper up? The yeah, let me get the screen share. I, just, okay. I can't. You're gonna have to. This you're gonna one. have to scroll it for me, right? Yep. Can you? You can yep. scroll that for me. Yep. Algae. Are you going to read it and I'll scroll it? You yeah. Guys... All so, right, guys. There we go. Okay. So, okay. The first thing, that first quote, right? I mentioned this quote before. That guy, now Monterey Bay, if you go to their, they have a YouTube channel. I, I searched this guy's name, right? To see what kind of follow up he's doing. In Monterey Bay, they're completely um, monitoring the, uh, algae levels in the ocean. They're using Argo. Normally you use satellites to read the algae levels and you can get like the whole, you know, surface, you can get the surface algae blooms for the whole world. But what they're using is they're using these Argo floats and they can monitor the, the algae at depth because you want to see how it's being sequestered, the carbon's being sequestered. So they're going to put out like 250 Argo floats. So they're way into the, they're like completely fixated on, you know, how this, the biological carbon cycle of the ocean. So it's definitely a big science deal. Okay, okay. So, so we have these five different, we have seven different ways of how algae can, can, you know, help um, sequester carbon and, and, but the, this fake whale feces um, project would be the biggest one because that would be 35 gigatons per year. So we're going to okay. focus on that. Now, if you scroll down, um, now this is where I get into the, what makes the algae special is that 50% um, of the photosynthesis of the planet is actually from the algae, but the algae is um, one one hundredth, one one hundredth of the um, biomass of life mm -hmm. on, uh, on the planet. So you have this huge difference in photon radiation efficiency and when you really study algae, um, they've discovered recently that photosynthesis, it works through quantum uh, non-locality, which, which means it's an instantaneous uh, energy transfer that's oh. it's super, lum super luminal, faster, faster than the speed of light. And this is the origin of all life on Earth. So algae has been around for th 3.5 billion years, and it's what first um, allowed life to spread onto land. So in other words, if we, if we focus on the photon radiation, then we want to focus on the algae because it's 
you know, it's so much more efficient than any other life form on Earth in terms of sequestering carbon through the photon radiation. Okay, this really quickly, this would not be something Jim Massa would not like. He would like this because we had the show on all those schemes, but this wasn't one of them. Okay, the the what makes this different is it's the it's replacing what the whales like you asked about the whales. So there's I think it's like um, I give the figure of how many whales were killed. I think the latest approximation is three million. And and Sir Dave. Sir David King said, I think it was 4.5 million because 3 million is a low, that's like a conservative, you know, lowest, lowest number. And it was certainly more than 3 million. And so essentially this, this, this fake whale um, feces would be spread in the deep ocean where that used to be where the whales would, would circulate, you know? So, so that's what it's replacing. Okay. So if we, you can scroll down. Um, so this is where I quote the Raymond Pierre Humbert. And mm-hmm. if you click, you know, that's the, his physics today paper about the quantum physics origin of global warming. And he's quoting four year and he's basically saying, you know, four year figured it out 200 years ago. And so we can scroll down past that. Okay. So, um, okay. So these are the other options, you know, the way we can use algae. Cause you think of, okay, like obviously they want to, um, switch out the coal, plants and that's like 40 percent of global co2 emissions well you can you can use um algae to capture capture the fuel of co2 emissions and the algae will capture like half of the um coal emissions um anyway we keep we can keep scrolling down so they're already starting to do that there's a there's a several plants that are already doing that operationally um the other thing is, is you can treat wastewater so the algae will eat the um the, the feces you know and then it will clean the water that way. And then of course you can use all this algae. You can use, either use it for animal feed or fertilizer, or you can make biofuel out of it. And it's the most, by far the most efficient source of biofuel. Okay. So oh, let's keep scrolling down. Um, so people are already doing that. Now here's the video we just showed. Now, if we keep scrolling down and we can, we can quote Sir David King. He says, my ambition, my ambition is to cover two to 3% of the deep ocean surfaces every year um, with the synthetic whale poop. And then he says, we hope to return the global whale fish and crustacean population to where it was. So the idea is that this would be a transition to bring by increasing the krill and fish population, you'd actually bring the whales back because then their, their populations would increase because they'd have more, a bigger food supply. And so, um, but it, you know, so you're transitioning by using this volcanic ash, you're actually just doing what they would call re- restoration ecology or re- regenerative. Right. Not, they're, they're not, it's not geoengineering. It's restoration exactly. ecology. Yeah. Cause it's natural yeah. fertilizer, yeah. volcanic ash, and you're doing it in the deep ocean. Now, now, um, now he says that if we do that, we could remove 35 to 40 giga- gigatons a year. Now that's currently the roughly the level we're currently emitting every year. Now, so I'm going to go into that. That's, that's the end of my, okay, you can clear that out. That's the end of that. Okay. And then the, the last now, thing we'll have is that when you're ready for that. Right. So now there's obviously um, the problem again, as that video showed with Sir David King, is that in 2008, the UN said, no, you cannot fertilize the oceans and they stopped the iron fertilizer. And then, but he's like, you know, Jim Massa, he's critiqued the iron fertilization as well, because he's like, it's complicated. But so this is a di- yeah. different thing. Now, the other thing is like everybody, when you say algae, when we talk about algae, the immediate thing that people, um, I, I eat, I eat algae every day too. So the other, the other cool thing about algae is it's, that's what powers our bodies. Cause there are every cell in our body has mitochondria in it. And that used to be algae, the algae, the mitochondria, like algae, um, invaded other cells, whether it was like fungi or plants, and then they became mitochondria. So that's what they call symbiosis. So that's, so we are basically worse, like walking around like algae on, on land, you know? Yeah. And so, so the only, only difference between um, chlorophyll and red blood cells is that chlorophyll has magnesium in the center and red blood cells have iron. So you can literally clean your blood by eating uh, spirulina, which is the algae. Yeah. You know? So that's what, right. So, so this is, so in other words, like we basically are algae, you know, like if you think about it. Should be or, a song. that's what. <laughs> it should be a song. Mm-hmm. Okay, so now, okay, so basically the idea is like, well, 
I, I actually emailed Sir David King because like they they he's doing research. He has he's out of Cambridge University and he has this like com climate research center and he's collaborating with like half a dozen other universities and they've been doing um, research vessels. They've sent out research vessels vessels to do experiments so they can do experiments with this deep um, ocean fertilizer. Um, and but the thing is, is when are they going to scale it up? Because obviously. Um, yeah, that's that. That's what it is. It's the see algae. That's a good point because this is see this is bacteria. This is cyan cyanobacteria. Yeah, algae 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 just means single cell organisms. So it's it's the oldest the oldest algae is cyanobacteria. But then you have single organism. Um, what became plants? There's only one one part of algae. Like one species of algae became all the plants on Earth. It literally all plants on Earth one are derived species. From Wow. Yep, and there's thousands of species, or it's one. Maybe it's one phylum. It might be one one genus or one phylum. But I, but it, at any rate, one branch of of algae moved on to land, and then it, that's what all all plants on on land are from, you know. So so, Amazing. but the point is, is that the oldest algae is this cyanobacteria. That's what spirulina is. So mm -hmm. so you, so you as long as it's a single cell. Like the interesting thing about algae is you can have one single cell, and it can be as big as your your whole hand it can be your whole hand but it's just a single cell so they can use that to study uh, cells because and then when you see seaweed that's called macro algae because those are actually single cells but they're just bigger but the, what makes algae so um efficient at photosynthesis is because unlike plants you don't have to have leaves stems or roots right. you don't need leave you don't need roots stems or leaves because the algae is just floating so it's not competing with gravity at all so you can just focus on um photosynthesis okay so so i had i didn't hear back from i didn't hear back from sir david king because i'm like look when are, when are we going to be able to do this you know because obviously i have that quote from the monterey research institute the senior scientist saying that you know when climate gets out of control the only thing that can save us is algae the only thing that can yeah. save us is algae when climate gets out of control and so it's far there's hundred there's literally hundreds of research institutes that are working out on algae but they're all focused on the land so they grow it in big um tanks like plastic lines yeah, technologically open. they're growing it yeah, like, like it's a geoengineering yeah. project yeah they're they're either trying to genetically engineer it or they're saying well we can use it as feed animal feed or human food and it would it's like they're saying it is the future of food because Doesn't they're saying well remove the, green... the methane from cows too algae yeah that's another right exactly they that's that company just went commercial recently where they they they're I'm doing now, my homework <laughs> yeah thank you sandy so that there's so many there's there's like literally you have hundreds of research institutes saying the future is algae they make it into plastic you know like guy mcpherson he, he likes to too. quote the the uh dustin hoffman movie where there's like the future is plastic yeah. so from the 1960s but now the like i worked in a plastics factory. yeah i worked in a plastics factory you know, so I have firsthand experience. I worked with one of those um, mold, mold injection mold injection machines. I wore a gas mask because of the fumes. Can't imagine. Yuck. So, okay. So, but literally, they make they can make algae into plastic. Like the, it's it becomes plastic. I don't know how they're doing so it, but it's like if we don't burn up the planet first, there's a little hope for this to be something that could take off if. Does it well, okay, investors? I'm, it's capitalist society right. here. Okay, I'm glad you say that about if we don't burn up the planet first, because I don't know if you saw like Paul Beckwith's latest video where he's saying, With, well, the reason that yeah, ahead. the aerosol, the um, what do you call it, AMOC is the reason the we haven't had a blue ocean event yet because the AMOC slowed down, so therefore you have less warm water against the Arctic, and so it's not as it's not melting as fast as it would if AMOC hadn't slowed down. Now, the other thing is that, um, so there's, so he's saying, well, that's buying us a little time. But of course, Jim Mass is emphasizing that, you know, we're approaching 500 zettajoules of extra heat in the ocean. Damn. And we only have, we only have about 20, maybe 23 extra zettajoules of heat from human uh, global warming in the atmosphere. So you compare 500 zettajoules to 23 zettajoules in the atmosphere. And obviously, the ocean heat is just, you know, way, way, way more. And that's still going to get released. And, and so the other thing is like, well, how fast it gets released is depends on, you know, how hot the ocean is obviously now. 
And so then you have the, um, like you said, I can mention, you know, the East Siberian Arctic Shelf, the world's largest ocean shelf, and it has 1,200 gigatons of pressurized methane. And Jim Massa, he personally knows Natalia Shakova and that whole Russian research group that f focused on the on the East Siberian Arctic Shelf. And so if you read Natalia Shakova's latest paper that she co-authored with like a dozen other people, and they're just saying that the methane is already releasing out of ESAS um oh, at an acceler accelerated rate it's more methane than the rest of the oceans combined in the world it's more methane than all the arctic uh, permafrost methane and yet it doesn't get mentioned at all you know anywhere oh and if, msnbc if you, isn't going to talk about this Drew. <laughs> you know and that's the other thing is that they just they just released a study that even though 2023 broke all these global warming records the corporate media coverage of global warming actually went down and it's only 1% of the news in the corporate media is on global warming. So it's less than it's ever I know, been. I saw that it's been now it's the uh, alternative sources that are telling us <laughs> that that's happening. <sighs> and the problem is, it's like, I, I follow, you know, I've, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'm basically, I'm, I'm obviously, I'm just a nerd, right? Like I just, I just read on, I read all the time about research and all that. I use Google Scholar and I also use Sci-Hub because if you use Sci-Hub, any kind of research that's behind paywall, you can read it through Sci-Hub. And the lady that created that website, she has to be in hiding. You know, she was Jeez. from, I think she was from the Ukraine or Kazakhstan or something, but she basically, she had to, you know, but the thing is, is that you can read, I read the science directly. You know, I read, I read it on Google Scholar, I read Sci-Hub, I read ResearchGate, I read Archive. And then I've cor I correspond with professors directly. So like I've correspond with Nobel physicist, uh, Brian Josephson. And if anybody has gotten an MRI, it's because of Brian Josephson. He, he discovered the Josephson effect. Um, and, but he cannot get published by, um, archive he cannot even Not get a paper in, in archive Christ. because because he he writes about the paranormal you know he he's a nobel physicist and he's like yeah the paranormal it's been documented it's real and of course you can't say that it's you know well that's so happened I, but you've experienced those kinds of things through your meditation yeah there's something in science called non-commutativity and that's one thing i was razzing elliot elliot um jacobs about elliot what's his name elliot jacobson jacobson, jacobson. Because he was a math professor and I'm like, well, he doesn't know about non-commutativity. And then he's like, he's like, I wrote a paper on non-commutativity. You know, he got, he got, he immediately got really like. We got to get you. He got act. miffed. He got miffed about it. At but you. I got banned from Twitter because I was promoting the Dakota Pipeline protest all the time. Well, and I, you, you know, as a come back on there and get into our little community, you won't be banned anymore. It's changed. <laughs> Yeah, so so you know, YouTube YouTube's definitely enough virtual reality for me. Like it's the social um, <laughs> yeah. social media. Yeah. That the but I was, you know, like as a protester, I'm used to like chanting at rallies and all that. And so that's what I was doing on on X, but of course they it, I'm sure it triggered whatever spam algorithm thing, you know, it's like so they so they immediately just deleted my account. I'm like, whatever, I don't have time for that. <laughs> Look. You're yeah. giving somebody a little optimism because algae, you know, it's something that seems not scary to do. Oh, let's let's play that final video. Okay. That, the final video. All right, let's get there. All right, here we go. I have a lot of shit on my screen, so can you full on. screen it? I'm gonna full screen it, baby. I'm gonna <laughs> full screen it. All right, I'm on. I think I got it. Carbon apparently takes you know, about four passes through the surface layers before it ever manages to get oxidized. So that's the background. And what I can we I do can't make it any louder. That's, that's all right. Oh, I can't. Yeah, his voice, well, the, the audio is fine. Consider here is augmenting this 11 gigatons a year that settles out. And we can get our necessary 30 gigatons a year by effectively quadrupling, quadrupling of the life form in the carbon soup. As they we could fertilize the surface layers, as in iron fertilization, or uh, you can do this lots of places. Mm. The only trouble is, is that in order to do it this way, you'd have to fertilize for fourfold worldwide. Mm. That's an enormous amount. If you're gonna rely only upon the settling out of heavy debris to do the job, so unless we quickly develop a far more efficient method for sequestering the excess circulating carbon, 
uh, we're back into seeing our escape routes, routes closing off. So let's X that one out for the moment. And now I ask whether we can do something about downwelling. Well, we could pipe it down or we could augment the whirlpools. I, I would, for the moment, just conserve both of them together. And that, of course, uh, is sinking not only the um, living stuff, but it's sinking that far more uh, massive uh, dissolved organic carbon. Now, this is very much like plowing under a crop. Uh, that is to say, if we fertilize via pumping up and sink nearby via bulk flow, we would essentially be burying a carbon-fixing crop. It's much as farmers plow under a nitrogen-fixing cover crop. Instead of sinking only the debris that is heavy enough, we would be sinking the entire organic soup which currently, before fertilization, is in the North Atlantic, about a gram of carbon in a cubic meter. Uh, the Atlantic's meridional overturning circulation, these uh, eddies and whirlpools, and uh, the Greenland Sea and the Labrador Sea, and a few other places, uh, currently sink about six-tenths of a gigaton of carbon per year because of that. We need to sink about 50 times as much. And so we might consider fertilizing in those areas to try to get the concentration up enough. But basically, I think we need another method rather than just using the existing uh, circulation, which also turns out to be very vulnerable, as I'll come back to. Yeah. Uh, the needed sunlight's better at lower latitudes, and so we also need an estimate now for plankton plantations that do their own fertilizing and sinking. Now you can obviously do this with windmills pumping up from one depth and with another set of windmill pumps that pump down to a different depth. Uh, you can also do it with a much cheaper uh, affair, which is just basically an open pipe that has a trapdoor valve added and it's held up by a buoy and it's weighted down by a, uh, some ballast. But what this does is on the upstroke of, of a wave carrying this up a few meters, hmm. uh, the trapdoor valve opens and basically this causes the water that's inside the pipe to sort of be left behind at the bottom as, it's as if it were extruded. Uh, then on the downstroke of the wave, the trapdoor valve is going to close. And then on the next upstroke, you're leaving behind surface water in the depths again. Uh, put the trapdoor valve uh, swinging the other way, and you have an up pump. As say on the downstroke of the wave, the thing's going to fall with the trapdoor valve open, and that's going to leave behind deep water uh, mm -hmm. near the surface. Mm -hmm. So let's get an estimate now for the fertilization need. Uh, we can use some figures from agriculture. Uh, one advantage is that uh, agriculture minimizes respiration CO2 from higher up the food chain. And so it gives us, allows us to make, estimate what the minimum size of a plankton plantation would be as a percent of the ocean total. And we have to hope this is not 150%. Uh, suppose that a mid-range 50 grams of algae can be grown each day under a square meter of sunlit surface, about half of that is carbon. That means it takes about 10 to the minus 4 square meters uh, to grow about 1 gigaton of carbon each year. So to sink 30 gigatons of carbon yearly would require about 8 tenths of 1% of the ocean surface, which is about the size of the Caribbean. So the Caribbean is not particularly where you want to do this. The uh, space requirement might be less because you're not going to fiddle with oil-containing algal species that uh, are very fussy mm. about what concentrations you do them at. Uh, you're going to do it with the existing indigenous algal species. And you're going to try to sink them just as quickly as possible to make room for more to be grown. 
The ocean pipe spacing and the volume pump down are going to depend upon the outflow that you need to optimize the organic carbon production's cyclical fraction. This is what's called the dilution problem in the literature. Uh, only field trials are really likely to provide this estimate that you need to find the needed size of the plantation, the pump numbers, and therefore what's going to cost. Uh, I want to give you just one example of how it Okay, do you want to discuss this a little bit? Okay, and, let me just were, explain. Yeah. I'll explain because we started it. Um, basically, he's saying that if you do this scheme where um, Sir David King is saying, well, we can sequester 30 gigatons of uh, carbon a year um, by just spreading on like 1% of the ocean, this fertilizer. Yeah. What this other professor, William Calvin, he's saying that, well, if you look at the carbon cycle in the ocean, what happens is, is that a lot of that, most of that turns back into CO2 and it'll get go back out into the atmosphere. And so he's saying that you need to have some kind of pump to um, make sure you have, he says you have basically have a one month um, window where you can pump down the, um, the algae and the feces or whatever that's, cause the krill will eat the algae or whatever. And then they poop it out and the krill poop and all that. So in other words, if you have these pumps in the ocean and now he's not the only one saying that, like there's a company on the West coast that's growing uh, kelp. And then they're saying, well, we'll grow the kelp and then we'll just pump it off the um, cliff off the ocean shelf. And that will make sure it, you know, and then we'll, we'll also, you know, basically like Jim Mass has been talking about how the circulation of nutrients in the ocean is, is shutting down because the ocean's overheating. So essentially what, um, Professor William Calvin, this guy who just, the video we just watched, he's actually a neurobiologist and he studies evolution. So he's sort of like an interdisciplinary um, biologist. So so when he's getting into this um, realm of the, the carbon cycle, you know, it's like he's, he's whatever, it's biology. So he, he knows biology too. But the, so the thing is, it's like what they call the biogeochemical cycle. This is called a biogeochemical cycle. So, so in other words, if we want to do this uh, carbon fertilization, we need this extra step to speed up the process. And he's saying that because otherwise, we even if we create um, 30 gigatons of carbon that's sequestered into the algae, right. only 11 only 11 gigatons will actually go down to the deep level of the ocean to get so sequestered. It's too little too late though let, let me let me get some questions up here because uh i think i don't know he's he, he has a three-year he has like a four-year plan he's like we can do yeah. this in four four years is anybody yeah, it's really, funding him well see okay he's just a professor he's actually yeah. retired he's a professor he's emeritus retired. that's why that's why i wanted you to show his video because okay. if you go to his website he, he only has like 50 views you know oh, i read we'll his get book. It, we'll get it on i'll get the link in and everybody I, can then do it and, yeah, and watch the whole I, thing so they can learn. Yeah. See, I read, I read his book. I was mm -hmm. reading one scholarly book a day. So I read his book on, he has a couple books on climate change and the size of the human brain. And, and basically he's arguing, you know, as humans, our ancient history has been tied in with um, the ice ages. And so every time there's a, a switch over from the end of the ice age, then it's a big, we go through a bottleneck of humanity and we have to learn to adapt to that somehow. And he's basically saying, well, this is another, you know, adaptation well whether you want to call it that or not you know it's like i but the thing is is that he's his what he says makes sense i emailed i just emailed him tonight i said well have you have you sent this to sir david king you know like like if you're you look trying at the Monterey, to bring these people together i like that yeah that's what i do is i just i just communicate with the professors directly and I, a lot of times like for example Sab sabine hassenfelder you might have heard of her but she yeah, has a big I've seen her videos yeah, and yep. she's like, I was, I was wrong. She posted a video like maybe six months ago, and she I said, was wrong I on was... climate change. Well, Boy, yeah, does she get and... a rash of shit in the comment sections? But the thing is, is that <laughs> she says she she was quoting Raymond Pierre Humbert, and so I had been corresponding with Raymond Pierre Humbert through email, and so I emailed him. I said, Well, do you know about this? And he goes, Yeah. She actually emailed me with questions, you know, to clarify Wild. his read. But the thing is, is like, okay, she's, she's a well-known, like her, like if you go to physics, most physicists, they don't even mention global warming. You know, it's like, like you look like the U S military is by far the biggest emitter of global warming. Now, 50% of physics research is for the U S military. You know what I mean? Yes. So it's like, they don't, 
like you know the u.s military they say they're going to be go green you know they're going to go all all sure. electric like, like the u.s <laughs> army, army you know the the, the darpa darpa funded sure. algae research the darpa funded biofuel algae research you know to use algae for their army for as jet fuel you know they want to use algae as jet fuel in the so it's like the darpa you know they funded it early on but it's like they don't it see but go you anywhere? have to realize well, because see, they're still thinking of it in terms of economics and money and profit. But yeah. what we're talking about is like growing food and ecology. It's like if it's too hot to grow food, you know, you can't eat money. You know what I mean? Like people are so uh, fixing. No. Like if you don't have if you don't have money, you're not worth anything in our culture. You know, like in our society, all people care about is money. It's like if you don't have money, then you're, you're a total loser. You've wasted your life. You know, I have people come to me like, "What have you done with your life?" You know, it's like because I because all I've done is activism as a volunteer. You know, so it's like. Even if you work at these, there's a book called Activism Incorporated, because most people who work at like activists and nonprofits, they're like begging for money and they can't, even, you know, maybe they can pay for some beer, you know, if they can afford their rent, you know, and if they try to union, if they have a, try to have a union, then all of a sudden, you know, these big corporate lawyers are coming in, they're getting Rockefeller grants, you know, so like the, the administrators are making a hundred thousand dollars a year from Rockefeller money, you know, so they can't, right. they can't, they don't, they can't be, they can't really say what's going on because they can't rock the, um, Rock you can't rock the boat. Yeah, the Rockefeller money. It's like okay, James E. Hansen he even talks about this in his latest paper. He has a brand new paper out. Yeah. About the aerosol mask. I effect. downloaded it, but I did not read it yet. Well, he's saying that the if you look at the IPCC modeling, you know, they they're claiming the aerosol masking effect was zero for all the time pre-industrial, but he's like that's not true because all the all the um we were burning wood all that time and so actually it was a half a degree, half a watt um per meter squared or something for so the so, you know, obviously, like this was um, Daniel Rosenfeld came out with this research. I don't know about ten years ago, and then Guy McPherson hopped on it right away, where he's saying, "Well, he discovered you know the aerosol masking effect is twice as bad, so that creates what he called you know what they call it the Guy McPherson paradox, because it's like, you know, all this renewable energy that's being promoted is just going to heat up the planet more." And Leon and so, Simmons has run with it. Yeah. And so, so the thing is, is like what, if you look at the IPC modeling, they're like, well, net zero means that you're going to start, um, you're going to start storing carbon. You're going to have to have some sort of carbon capture. Well, the thing about algae is that it's not just carbon capture, but it's also how you grow food. It's also, you can use it as biofuel. You can use it as fertilizer. Um, Everybody's can, saying soil and green. It is, it is literally soil and green, because if you think about it, like, mitochondria in our bodies it's what it what runs our like if you look in the mitochondria they say the health of the human is based on the health of the mitochondria <laughs> you know it's all i do is read all i do is research that's all the okay time. that's okay i like it I, I mean how long have we been we've actually corresponded for quite a long time let me get some questions here because people all right um let's go to all the way to the top and go backwards naturally the huge population of whales we once had did a major biogeoengineering job wow we really need the algae that the original volume of whale poop produced right right and it's yeah, all natural i like all well, the see, natural the first the very first oil was whale whale blubber was the first oil and what happened was rockefeller then they switched to kerosene and they're like okay we'll have kerosene lamps instead of whale oil lamps yep. you know we'll run we'll run our machines on we'll you know on oil right. instead of whale whale blubber. stop killing the, the whales all right let's see um the amok paper going back to that did not discuss two major factors keeping the arctic cool okay Maybe. tell us more yeah but well, okay he, he did uh, let me let me let me tell you something since I have the, um, since whatever, let me just, I'm just gonna, okay, what Paul, what Paul Beckwith did not do that I noticed, see, when I use Google Scholar, the first thing, the great thing about Google Scholar is they tell you who cites the paper. So he gave the paper title, I went, I typed that paper title into Google Scholar to see how many times it was cited. It's only been cited once. And so I looked at the paper that cited it, I read that paper, and that was all about AMOC. That was about ah. AMOC. And it's basically saying, it's basically agreeing with their results, but it's saying it's more complicated than that. Like it's saying, I mean, if you look at like Jim Massa, he's, you know, Jim Massa, he's, he's, he knows what he's talking about. He's saying, well, the overall trend is obviously global warming. And like, if you look at how much heat has accumulated in the oceans, he's saying, well, he thought AMOC, you know, was shut down the heat. And then Guy McPherson just did a video about how there's a new brand new paper on AMOC showing that actually it's not going to cause and, a- Didn't him and Jim do the, the 
a video the same they, day. <laughs> they did. Yeah, yeah, they did a video on uh, the water, groundwater depletion. Oh, that was it. You know? Yeah, not the other yeah. one. We've done so many AMOC shows, you know. I, I mm -hmm. remember when I first learned about it years ago, I was sitting outside. I did a video and read about it to, just sitting out with the phone, you know, like I think it was on Facebook, too, before I was even on you know, YouTube. A really good source on AMOC is um, Rachel Carson's book. You remember Rachel Carson? She wrote The um, Silent yeah. Spring. Yeah. She she wrote a follow-up book on that on just on the oceans, and she has a whole thing on AMOC, you know. Right. And, and but that was it like is in the slowing, though. Kristen asked, it is slowing. Mm -hmm. We He talked about it earlier, uh, what is yeah, happening. It's, it's slowing, but if you like, if like for example, Scripps Scripps Oceanography, they just did that big research expedition into the Pacific, and they documented the heat blobs. The heat blobs that are going into the Arctic from the Pacific side, and so and like Jim Mass is saying, well, the Mediterranean is the reason why the Atlantic side is so hot is because there's so much heat coming up from the Mediterranean that's going. Wow. So so I mean, the thing is, is like yeah it's slowing but the heat in the ocean is 90 percent of the heat and it's so much more that it's just going to keep increase. that's what he increased evaporation and less insulation from the ice mm -hmm. yeah which is what the yeah, paper but, didn't go into yeah but in the, and the other thing is it's like um you know if you read the arctic news blog spot like mm -hmm. sam crana Sam Crana, I don't know if she, if he or she, I know. I, We're I in the theory. same he, arena. I, I read what you read. Yeah. I basically, every day I go to my blog, I have a blog post called Abrupt Global Marine News. I go to my blog and I have all my links from my Abrupt Global Marine News. And I go through that and I go through Peter Carter, Guy McPherson, Paul Beckwith, um, Arctic, the Arctic News blog spot. Then there's also um, Jim Hunt. He has one called The Great White Con. He has a blog on. Um, he likes to debunk uh, that uh, Tony Heller guy. Yeah. You know the. And then I just found also, another guy that does the debunking on, uh, uh, and uh, he's from uh, he's from down by the Hudson. No, 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 no. This guy just uh, does it. He's on Twitter. He's debunking all the creepy, stupid morons. He's from, uh, I don't have his name in my head, but his name is Sal. And he lives in, he lives near the Hudson River, right where I used to live. And I listened to mm -hmm. one of his Twitter spaces they have. And they, he was talking all about, they were talking, it was very interesting, the Twitter spaces. You can walk around the house, do things, and you're listening to scientists just talk about all these different things. I'm telling you, you might like it, but anyway. All right, listen. I'm, I'm glad you like it. <laughs> I do, even though I can't stand Elon Musk. All right, here's a question. Elon but, Musk. Yeah, Elon Farthead. Well, I have, okay, I have a um, playlist on. Did you? I oh, gave you I the have link. a oh, wait. No. There was that but question. If you if you, if you go to my question? channel, Here if you is. go to my channel, I have a playlist on microalgae. But she wants to know where you have a do you have a, a list of what you're reading so we can read and discuss <laughs> like a book club. Uh, maybe we need a Drew book club. Well, you're talking Avoid about algae, what I'm what I'm reading on algae. I think she was. To, she's a librarian. <laughs> That's Karen. Go, did you watch her show with me? She's a librarian. She did the Enroads. She did the Enroads. She was on your show. Yeah, she did the Enroads oh. training. You got to watch that episode. It was nice. It was really nice. Anyway, okay, so I have. If you go to my academia link, it's on my channel, my YouTube channel, and that get, that has all my papers and free and free books. And then my like, I have one book. It's got like seven hundred and twenty-five references. You know, so it's like you can. You okay, can I'll have those links in, and everybody can. I had like somebody in two thousand six. Somebody said, "What are your favorite books?" And I. I gave like 50 different books that were my favorite books at that time. You know, that was in 2006, you know, so that was like 20 years ago almost. There's so a I, lot I, have been written I since then. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't read books as much now as I read papers online because I read all the, um, you know, I read like science papers on Google Scholar and uh, Archive and ResearchGate. And, um, you know, so I'm mainly reading um, science papers and then I go through, I'm, I'm a big YouTube addict. I, I love, Obviously. I, I, yeah, I watch. I watch all. I get news news from all over the world on YouTube. So I I get the news from Kenya. I get the news from, you know, Nigeria. I get the news from you know all all the all the countries all all Good. over. I just I like to get, and then I and then then I post them on your on your channel, Sandy. You know all the all the environmental stuff like. You know, there's a drought here. Like we have that. I know you do. You do it. You do it all the time. And then I look. I I, I look. look to see what's going on. 
So the UN, the UN is saying that this year there's going to be 309 million people that won't have enough food to eat. And, and that's, and that I did a video on that because if they're saying, they're saying that's a record number of people, 309 million. But the thing is, is that when you consider that in the northern, northern Midwest where I live, we literally had no winter. And so they're saying, well, we, we just didn't. had some, yeah, they're saying, well, we just had some snow, so that's going to help with the drought. But but you don't you don't know like we could we could have we could really have a total crop loss of of food this summer and it's like every time something happens they're like well we didn't expect that to happen you know oh, like bullshit. that's the that's why i'm that's growing the... my food i got my flats and everything going and i have you know canning shit then I'm, i have it if i need it let's go to some yeah. more questions come on well then of course you know guy guy mcpherson's big point is like well the the nuclear power plants are gonna are gonna be melting down because when you when you don't have any food you know people are they're not gonna do their jobs you know they're not gonna like i that was one of my thing the first time i got arrested was against storing nuclear um radiation on the mississippi river they they store <sighs> nuclear waste and so you know when you when you look at like the two-headed depleted uranium babies like you can look that up and you can see photos there are there are two-headed babies from depleted uranium and they're using depleted uranium right now in ukraine they use it all the time and that was that was made in minnesota you know i got i got arrested i was in jail for for alliant alliant tech they moved their headquarters they were headquartered in minnesota they moved it out to the the, the military um trough you know the the dc like they're in Fairfax, Virginia, or whatever. I don't know, somewhere around there. Like, some place I wouldn't want to be. <laughs> All right. So, this is so, what you we, know, we, we, can... we, 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 I've <laughs> got to bring this up, though, because we have to get back to the algae for a minute because people mm -hmm. are, that had questions and they, and mm -hmm. about safety. And I wanted to go, okay, here, Tommy. You mean like the toxic algae blooms? Well, yeah, okay. remember, however, that algae may have caused a mass extinction that wiped out three quarters of marine life 445 million years ago. What, so I how mean, was that? I don't, I don't know how was that algae because algae creates oxygen. So you're saying it was okay. too much oxygen. Was there too much oxygen? Is I think that's what I think they're saying. Maybe it was too much oxygen that caused the. There's the a research area for you. Well, I I don't see how that would be an issue now because we're running okay. out of oxygen oh. on the planet. We're yeah. storing it's storing CO two and creating oxygen. So it's like yeah, way okay. back way back when when we could have it could have plunged the planet into an ice age. Maybe if there was too much oxygen, I don't know. Back he might then. be thinking of methane though. If he's thinking of methane. I don't know. Um, Tommy, if you're to put it back in, if you have other thoughts, um, make American great again. Yeah. Putting algae into some pelletized feeds that cattle eat does remarkable, remarkably mm -hmm. reduce the amount of methane emitted by the animals. Yeah, um, wait a yeah they've, wait, they've, wait, discovered, um, they've discovered oh, does the... Does anyone know how the actual... They've, is okay. they've isolated the specific protein or enzyme or whatever it is that me. actually <laughs> that neutralizes the methane. They've already they've already discovered it and they've already, they're selling that now. They just went commercial scale like la last year. So they know, they know what, why it reduces, they know why it neutralizes the methane and they're producing it at scale. They're saying you, you, you don't have to put much feed it. You don't have to use much seaweed at, at all. And if you do it, it'll, it'll stop the methane, 95% of the methane. So you know, with so. local farmers where I live, will they do that? Well, that I list the company name on my blog. That's that's they're selling this this you know sea, seafood. They just went commercial last year. A anybody can Google it. They can just look up you know, um, you know algae seaweed for methane for cows or whatever, and that'll that'll get you the name of the company. There's also a company that's neutralizing the toxic algae blooms. They just have a uh, sodium per percarbonate, which turns into hydrogen peroxide when you put it in the water, and they're already using that you know to sequester all the toxic algae blooms. Lovelock talked about the dangers of genetically Good. engineered algae. Yeah. Um, ap apocalyptic consequences ensued. So are, is this, is that, was that in the 19, was that in the 1980s? Because the biology professor I mentioned before at uh, his name is Phil Regal. He was one of the first to okay, present to the, see. to the United Nations on the biosafety dangers of genetically engineered bacteria released into the Hi, ocean <laughs> okay. okay i just put she's she, it's great to see her um so so but the thing is is that okay i haven't mentioned this one one other company which is uh, rafael jovin he has a double oh. phd 
in marine biology and his company's called I, brilliant planet and yeah, he's saying that that's he's saying that this whole genetic engineering thing of algae is completely wrong he's like the whole point is just so it's not genetic it's not scary they, it's not monsanto no because they're just trying to sequester the co2 and so he's like if you're just trying to sequester co2 as ecology you're not trying to create biofuel so that's what exxon was doing they were trying to genetically engineer the algae to create biofuel but he's saying he's his goal he's like if we have near ocean algae farms and he already has he had a pilot farm in oman and he had one in south africa and now he has one right. in Mor morocco and he's being funded he's sequestering algae and then he mummifies it in the desert and he's like if he has all the land in the deserts around the world near the oceans he says he can wow. sequester 10 10 gigatons a year of algae you know through the brilliant planet company is that's the goal if he gets enough funding okay. and support you know and he's got lots of interviews on youtube too so he has uh, a vegan double, dawn double... i have to put her up i want you to answer her not buying their seaweed greenwashing bs well it's not seaweed see that's the whole problem if you're relying on seaweed as kelp you can at best like germany just came out and said well we have brown seaweed along you know that and the brown seaweed can sequester one gigaton a year and that's equivalent of germany's co2 emissions is one gigaton a year so they're saying if we just grow this enough brown kelp we can sequester all of our emissions just from growing seaweed now you would have to cover pretty much all the um i'm just i'm just talking about the evidence here i'm not talking about what's going to happen you know because i, know. I just said you know i've been arrested eight times and the military is the number one um global warming emitter so and that's Oliver, not going away all of our 50 percent of our physics research is for the military all of our funding like noam chomsky points out the so-called free market is really just right uh, mil military funding that has technology that you know so the whole dollar is based on the petrol dollar to promote oil you know that's the whole value of the u.s economy is well, based let's on oil. promote algae tommy has came back dead algae sinking to the ocean floor may have sequestered carbon 440 million years ago triggering the glaciation that accompanied the late uh, ordovician um, mass extinction okay so basically it took algae has been on earth for 3.5 billion years and it took algae 1 billion years to create enough oxygen for then for then complex life to develop on earth so we had the cambrian explosion um about 500 million years ago so that's if that if that extinction event happened like very soon after the cambrian explosion and so the thing is is that um that's you know obviously there's a difference between amount and rate and if you look at the co2 emission rates as raymond pierre humbert points out our current CO2 emissions are 100 times faster than the natural carbon yeah. cycle rate on Earth. So the natural carbon cycle is 12 gigatons per 200 years. And at a conservative estimate, we're approaching 1,000 gigatons and more likely it's going to be 5,000 gigatons in 200 years. And so obviously only algae has the ability to sequester that carbon when we most need it. And so that's completely different than whatever happened 445 million years ago. Because okay. I don't know what... You know, it's to okay. pay based on the rate of the CO2 emissions. Um, I'm all for algae, just not for enslaved animals ruining biodiversity. Right. We don't need cows. I understand what she's saying. I, 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 that, if we didn't have animal agriculture, we would have no need for the feed that eliminates methane. But, the you know, interestingly enough, with our, you think it's not going to happen right away, Dawn. I don't think well, so. You, but people again, are yeah. talking about having to change and get away from it. Absolutely. You, you have to, you have to, instead of focusing on the biomass, focus on photosynthesis. So, so if you look at the biomass in the oceans, it's only one one hundredth of all the biomass on land as, you know, biomass being alive carbon, you know, carbon bodies of life. Mm -hmm. Now, but yet that one one hundredth of biomass sequesters 50% of the CO2 and it's 50% of the photosynthesis for the planet. So how is that possible that only one one hundredth can sequester, can do 50% of the photosynthesis? So in other words, all, all of the life on, on land is nothing compared to algae because, you know, all, all life on the earth, you know, algae has been around for three, 3.5 billion okay. years. 
so it's like all life on on land is originates from algae first colonizing land you know like 500 million years ago or whatever i'm pretty so, sure uh, i got algae in my windowsills from all the rain <laughs> well the 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 mitochondria in your body is algae it's from algae so it's like we're literally yeah. like we are algae whether we accept it or not you know it's like all right what sorts of measurements will be needed to demonstrate the effectiveness of the whale poo types of well, biogeoengineering? That's what the Monterey Research Institute is doing with their Argo floats, is they can they can document very specifically the the biological carbon pump of the oceans. In other words, they can document the nitrate levels, mm -hmm. they can document um all the nutrient levels and the CO2 levels. Um, and so they can document just how much is being sequestered. And and so that's okay. what that very first that very first quote I gave was from 2008. Now somebody asked, well, why, how come this is not being done right now? Because obviously, you know, originally when you're just spreading iron and it was seen as geoengineering, then you're like Jim Massa has pointed out, well, that can mess up the whole, you know, it can create yes. more problems than it if solves. That was but, scary. So, but what they're talking about is just a general like volcanic ash in the deep oceans, which is would be replacing what the whales naturally did anyway. So it's like the, you know, it's a totally different and that, but the problem is, is the UN already passed a law, which is ironic because all these people that are brainwashed by the big oil propaganda, they're like, well, climate change is just a way to have global government. You know, they're, it's instituting global I government know. when in fact, when in fact the UN global law is holding us back from fertilizing the oceans at scale. It will only take us like five years to implement this um, program or we could do it. You know, it's only you only have to cover one percent or two percent of the ocean with this. Um, they're, they're, the experiment they used was they use rice hulls, rice hulls with like fertilizer in it. But then they were saying, well, we can also use volcanic ash. OK, so what would stop industry start burning more coal if carbon is being sequestered? What stops the fossil fuel industry? What stops Jevons Paradox? What stops, you know, what stops if it works? Yes, oh. And somebody okay. else asked, how would it look? How how would this look? So we can put those both questions. No, that's in. It. Okay, what the, would it the first like question, it mm -hmm. the first question is that, okay, we just pointed out the aerosol masking effect is twice as bad as previously thought. So if we were not burning coal, the, as, um, Guy McPherson emphasizes, uh, Professor, uh, who's the guy? He posts on um, Arctic News Blogspot all the time. Um, he's out of uh, Australia. Uh, Andrew Glickson. Andrew oh, Glickson yeah. says that the current the current atmosphere temperature is already over two degrees Celsius global average in pre-industrial. The reason we don't know that is because of burning coal creating the aerosol masking effect. Now, if you use algae, they're already having f fuel capture of the CO two. So you're burning the coal, but then you're you're not releasing, you're you're you know, cutting down the CO two emissions by like say fifty percent. Um, and then, but so you're still releasing all these sulfur particulates. You're still having the aerosol masking effect by burning the coal, but you're just not having the CO two emissions. But isn't the ultimate? But the ultimate goal would be to stop, you know, to 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 shrink civilization and get rid of the way we live in capital and consum consumption. Yeah. And the, and the, the thing is, is like, well, ever since we've been farming, we've created the aerosol masking effect. So like they, like there's been research, like the little ice age in Europe was caused by the mm -hmm. genocide, the genocide of the native Americans because the native Americans were farming also, and they were relying on burning, wow. you know, burning and creating a sulfur uh, particulates. So it's like, yeah, we would also have to reverse the, the wood wood burning um, aerosol. If you know, if we wanted to go back to how humans humans modern humans have been around for over two hundred thousand years, two hundred twenty five thousand years, the DNA evidence shows we um we split off to um we split off from the pygmies. The the San Bushman culture split off from the pygmies uh, two hundred twenty five thousand years ago. That's what the DNA science shows. In the so you know we've been hunter gatherers for from two hundred twenty five thousand years ago up to ten thousand years ago. We were hunter gatherers on earth and so we were you know we did fine i mean we hunted the megafauna uh, down after but the latest um evidence um in our college archaeology actually shows that the hunter gatherers were living with the megafauna for like thousands of years mm -hmm. in the in new mexico they have the sand prints 
of the um, petrified prints of the mammoths with the um, Native Americans from like 20,000 years ago. And they were there for thousands of years. They've, so they've proven that we didn't like totally kill off the megafauna, you know, right away. So right. it probably won't probably was from the Holocene kicking in, you know, the end of the ice age. All right. So, Tommy, increased aerosol masking effect plus accelerated carbon sequestration from algae. Can anyone say snow piercer? <laughs> well, the thing is, is like if you look at the Arctic amplification, the farther north you are, the faster the rate of global warming. So like where I live in the northern part of the state, it's already over 202 degrees Celsius above average. And that's just mainstream science. You know, that's from whatever they say, what is, what are they using? 1980 is the baseline. 1981 is the NASA baseline. Yeah. So it's, it's, when you look at, when you consider that we have to remove 600 gigatons of CO2, we have to remove like a thousand gigatons of CO2 to reverse the damage we've already done. So there's just absolutely, we've already ended Crazy. the next, we've already stopped the next ice age from happening. That's why they call it the Anthropocene right now. We've already Well, they don't the want to call it the Anthropocene. The geologists right. are kicking and screaming not to use mm. Anthropocene, even though we all damn well that are in, in the know understand we are not in the Holocene epoch anymore. <laughs> right. So my, my view is that scientists are not going to save us. Science caused global warming, but algae oil is from algae and algae is going to survive because algae has been on the planet for 3.5 billion years. And some algae can live in caves without any sunlight. And it, you know, it fixes nitrogen and stuff. So the future is algae, whether we want it to be or not. We can either, we can either promote the algae and work with Mother Nature, or we can just yeah. you know, destroy all life on Earth. But the algae will still survive, and and then it will eventually start complex life over. Tim just said, Sandy, autofocus. My camera does things on its own, Tim. <laughs> it's been a long show. I don't even know where to find that. If I was going to find it. I'm not even going to fuck with it. It's it's because I moved too fast or something anyway. Well, you know, we have been an hour and 48. It's good to see you here, Tim. Um, well, I think we've, we've really, yeah, we've had uh, quite a, quite a, um, yeah, life in a bio crippled world gives a very distorted view. Mm. Yep. All right, so I think we've done pretty good. What do you think, Drew? You want to take a couple more questions or comments? Or uh, I don't know. I don't, I we've we've had a lot of comments, yeah. yeah. So we we we've 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 captured we've captured a lot. Hold up a pen, he says. I love my. Ch wait, wait. I love <laughs> I think it fixed itself already. I I just no no waving around. Or, oh, my hands. All right, I'm getting tired. Okay, let's see. I think everybody's getting tired. There's a lot of information. So I'm going to put links in the notes. Tell us what you'd like to close with about this. I mean, you say save us. That's kind of a tough one, but. Okay, yeah, like how is, how can, how can human, how can the planets be saved from humans? Well, you know, it's like algae is going to be the future. Oil's from algae. We that oil is the problem, you know. So we're going to go back to algae one way or another. That's that's all I'm saying. It's like you can work with Mother Nature, or you could pretend that we're not from algae. We could you could pretend the mitochondria that's in every cell of our body is not from algae. You could pretend that you can be in denial, or you know, it's like or you can grow algae. You can grow. You know, I I got this algae from from China directly because it's half price because they're growing algae, you know, in China and then they, they just remarket it. I, 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 I have algae to brush my teeth every night. I yeah, use you this, told me. That's a good way to um, the get the earth. coffee out of your teeth. Yeah. That's, that's another another type of algae. And if you look in toothpaste, it'll say diatomaceous earth. Well, that's al diatoms or another type of algae. So it's like, I, and then you dr you swallow it because it's good for your hair. You know, the you know what you are, Drew? You don't. You are an algae activist. Hey, now you're hey talking. guys, we've got ourselves an algae activist. I, I, I think that, uh, yeah, that gets a little applause there. Well, it's been a, it's been a, I think it's been a really interesting show. I've enjoyed having you on. 
said Gene, Drew does have nice teeth. I know, I asked him. That's I said, how come I drink coffee, you drink coffee, and he's got white teeth and mine are shitty. My, and he just no, gave my, me the answer. My teeth were literally yellow before, and then I just scrubbed them with the diatomaceous earth. I just scrubbed them and... And then I and then I, I and then I swallowed it. I Why swallowed don't you just it? send me yeah. some? <laughs> All yeah. right. All right, guys. Thank Harris. you, everyone. Brand, brand name's Harris. H A R R I S. Harris. 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 All right. Well, Food. humans thinking they can master algae to solve problems associated with the growth addicted civilization. What could go wrong? Uh, we no, did a lot. <laughs> just let the algae do its own thing. You know, you don't need to master it. Like if we hadn't killed all the whales, then the algae would be there, you know. Yeah. So the idea is to bring the whales back, and then they'll, they'll, the algae cycle will be the way it used to be, before we killed off 4.5 million whales, you know. Well, I'd say about seven billion people too many then on the planet for <laughs> this. I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Chaz for the super the super chat. Yay! Thank you! Alright, it's time to go. Oh, grow the algae in Iowa? Hi, Snork. There is, there's already algae in a, an ethanol plant already has a commercial algae factory where they're sequestering all the... They're using it for feed. They're growing algae in uh, wow. Iowa. I can't remember what um, city it is offhand, but you can look it up. Uh, look up Iowa algae and you'll find it. It's been fun. I've really yeah, enjoyed the show. Thanks from uh, Co Costa Rica. Yeah, Shout Jean. Out. Yes. I was in Costa Rica for like three months. Yeah, so she wasn't here when you uh, earlier when you were talking about that. That was in this that was in nineteen cool. ninety ninety two. Well, I enjoyed. I learned over this show. You know, every show is is uh, preparation and learning and links and reading for me and you know videos and scientists and so this was very helpful I enjoyed it and I think everybody else did too so thank you Drew and I am going to say good night to you guys and I will see you what is it Friday I will see you on Tuesday Yes. Okay, thanks, Danny. Yeah, I have guests thanks. coming up too. Karen Perry's coming up. Roger Hallam's coming up. Jennifer's coming back Friday night. Hey. Yeah. Yeah. I was she's, wondering about. She's how needed Jen, a break. Jen doing. Oh, yeah. She's, she's great. We talk. It's just uh, she'll be on the fifth. So here's the the spirulina powder. All right, you've convinced us. Well, you got me. I'm gonna get white teeth now, guys. So. Oh, that, so this my, is the, the other stuff, the diatomaceous earth. <laughs> yeah, the diatomaceous earth. <laughs> diatomaceous earth, I love it. I love it. All Thank right, you. peace out. Thank you. Good night, Drew. Or you could stay in the green room till I'm done. But mm, love you guys. Peace out. Oh, and you can join me for Qigong meditation if you want. That's right. I'll put all the for links for free. For 9 a.m. Central Time. Yep. All right. Peace. Okay, thanks, Sandy.